All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I will agree with that beautiful woman who was just up here before. What a fun morning. Holy smokes. I love being able to see people's lives change in the way these two gals uh, today were being baptized. Um, I'm always like when we have baptisms, I come up like half wet because I'm like, I'm not going to miss an opportunity to give someone a hug that just had that kind of thing happen. So uh, glad you're here. Glad you're with us. Love our gift to the world Sunday and just hearing the history of where we've been and what we've been able to do is so incredible. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for being willing to uh, step out in this, this act of generosity, um, oftentimes to make yourself a little uncomfortable. Like it doesn't, it's not easy to just put money in a basket like that and be like, okay, God, I trust you. Um, but you are. And that's awesome. So uh, I apologize about halfway through my sermon today. My voice might start sounding like Josh Turner, um, which if you don't know who that is, he's a country singer with a really deep voice and sounds awesome. I'm doing it on accident because I'm a little sick, um, but afterwards I'll be putting out an album with that voice um, as well. So um, glad you're with us. We've been in this series called The Thread. I've loved every single moment of it. We have been taking this view. It's like 30,000 30, feet in the air looking down at the story of the Bible. Uh, I wish we could go into every single detail of the Old Testament, which is where we've been so far, but we can't. It would take us years. And so we've really just been looking at the full story. What has God done in his faithfulness through the story of the Old Testament, ultimately leading up to next week when we're going to talk about Jesus coming into this world. Um, but really every single week that we've had so far, we've got to see this connection that Jesus has really been part of the thread all the way through. And so we're going to get into a story on the exile this week. And um, I want to give us a little bit of a story to where we've been. I know some of you have been here every week, so you've heard every single message we've had. I know some of you haven't. So I just want to give us a quick glimpse of where we've been and where we're going today. So if it all started, um, if any of you are familiar with this story, God created everything. Um, that's how it all started. And there was Adam and Eve, and then they sinned against God, and sin entered the world. And then after a couple generations, you see this man named Abraham, uh, who God called to be the father of a nation, this incredible nation. This is this descendants would be uh, like the number of the stars in the sky, and that they would be in the promised land, this land that was set apart from them. And uh, that starts this kind of rhythm of the Israelite people, because his grandson Jacob, whose name was changed by, to Israel by God. He was the father of the Israelite people. He had 12 sons who were the tribes of Israel. And uh, they go into this time where they're enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. There's so many stories that you could try to break this all into. I'm giving you like the just quick look. So I apologize if you want to know more of the story. We have these Bibles. They're great. Um, you can read it. Um, but they're enslaved in Egypt for 400 years because of some crazy circumstances. And then uh, after 400 years, you've heard of Moses. He, Moses brought the people out of Egypt into the promised land. At least he tried to get them there, but he had to be stopped just short, and Joshua led them in. Uh, they were given the law during this time. So the first five books of our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, they're called what's in Hebrew the Torah, which is the law. And it was given so that it could be set apart people. It was that you would be a light to those around you if you lived your life uh, by these laws. Um, the Israelites weren't really good at following those laws, though, uh, and so they fell into sin. And it started this cycle as they were in the promised land. Joshua, Joshua had led them in. They'd established themselves in the land, and they started sinning against God. And this cycle became over and over again where they'd sin against God. God would give them over to their enemies. The enemies would oppress them. They would cry out to the Lord in repentance. He would raise up a deliverer in the form of a judge who would set them free and give them peace again in the land. And then the cycle would just start over again because they'd start sinning against God. And then I got to a point after this, and Chantal talked to you a little bit about last week, is that the Israelites, well, we need a king. They saw all these nations around them, and they all had kings, and said, well, we need a king. And God's like, you don't need a king. I'll be your king. Throughout the Old Testament, you see God's desire that he wants to be their God and that they will be his people. That's what God desired. But they still were like, no, we want a king. We need a king or else we're not going to get anything done around here. We need a king. And so God have Samuel, who was a prophet, anoint this guy named Saul, who was this good-looking, tall, military man that they were all excited about. He became the king of Israel. Uh, they loved him. He did a pretty good job for a couple minutes. And then he started making some poor choices and ultimately leading to God, removing the anointing from Saul and having Samuel place it on this young man named David, who was a shepherd boy in the city of Bethlehem. And then David rose to being the king of Israel. And as Chantal talked about last week, he was the greatest king that the nation had ever seen. I would probably say the greatest king that any nation in the world in its entire history has ever seen. 
outside of Jesus. But he was a great king, uh, even though he had his own faults. David made mistakes. If you know his story, he made some pretty dumb decisions in his life. Uh, But he never turned his back on God in all of it. He would always keep his faithfulness to God no matter what was happening. And he had to face consequences for his sins, but he never neglected his God. And then after David, he had a son named Solomon, uh, and Solomon is known to be the wisest man who had ever lived. God said, you could ask me anything, ask for anything from me, and Solomon said, just give me the wisdom. Give me wisdom. And God just poured that out on him. And if you read stories of Solomon in his, uh, in his time in the throne, I mean, he just does some incredible things that uh, really show his wisdom. But the problem with Solomon is that he was a human being. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. Uh, He was a human being, and his brokenness uh, and sinfulness really rose to the top. And he started making decisions that were really self-centered and, and decisions that were, that were really focused on, on gaining wealth. And he married hundreds of women just for political gain. And he gathered all of these riches for himself and the Israelites. And it was actually Solomon uh, who led Israel back into the worship of idols. And so really it tanked pretty quick uh, for Solomon and his kingship. Uh, Because he led them back into this worshiping of idols, which was something that we saw earlier on in the judges. So within this time of the kings and with Solomon, you then start to see another cycle of sin begin to occur. Because during the time of David, Israel is probably the healthiest it had ever been. But Solomon led them in another poor direction. And then it was in the years of Solomon and the generation of the kings to follow that you see that, that cycle of sin begin. It was uh, in the, book of, of the books of the kings, so 1 Kings and 2 Kings, which was we see in our Bible. Originally, it was just one big scroll, but in later days, they separated into two books. Uh, but in the book of the kings, you get to see uh, that in the generation after Solomon, between his two sons, there was a civil war. And so this nation of Israel was actually split into two nations. You had the southern nation that was called Judah, whose capital city was Jerusalem. And then you had the northern region that was Israel, and their capital became Samaria. And they didn't really like each other during this time. And in the history that we can read in the kings, uh, both nations had about 20 generations of kings, and those kings were mostly evil. They say in the northern kingdom, they went 0 for 20. They were all evil kings. In the southern kingdom, they went 8 for 20. So still not a, not a great record there. Um, But there was evil that rose up and ultimately led to a place where both of these nations um, and whole the Israelite people, uh, they were conquered and they were sent into exile. The northern region uh, were conquered by the Assyrians and the southern region was conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And this leads them into a time of exile where they were all taken out of their land and they were brought to the city of Babylon where they had to serve in exile. It's very similar to the time of Exodus. And Moses actually, in the end of Deuteronomy, he, he prophesies that they will be in exile again. And so this has now come to existence. They are in exile. Um, And during this time of exile, both in the kings and the exile, there were these prophets that rose up, that God rose up to speak on behalf of God to his people. If you read in our Bibles, uh, it's the Old Testament is separated in genres. And so you'll see you have the law in the beginning, and then you have the historical books, then you have uh, the books of wisdom. So you see like Psalms and Proverbs. And then after that, you see the prophets. And so while it looks like they happen at a different time, if you were to look at the Bible chronologically, all those prophets would actually actually come and line up right with this time of, of the kings and the exile. So if you've never read, read, uh, read, I did that first service too, read is a hard word to say. If you've never read the Bible in chronological order, in the order of things happen, I would encourage you to do so because it really helps you understand the story. And so this time, the prophets had, had come up. They had a pivotal role uh, during this time. Um, and so here we are. Israel has fallen. Uh, they are now in exile. Uh, They're in a place where everything is disoriented. They are in a place that everything is unknown. They're in a different culture uh, with different gods, with different traditions. And it is at this time of exile that the Israelites had to start asking themselves the question. And this is where I kind of want to focus us on this week. Because one of the questions that the Israelites had to ask, had to figure out, is how in this new land, in this new season of life, should we live? How are we supposed to live in this place of exile? How do we live in this foreign land of Babylon? How should we live under under the captivity of King Nebuchadnezzar? How should we live? Should we rebel against the Babylonian people, against this ungodly people? Should we fight back? Should we go into hiding? 
Or maybe we should just embrace the culture and the gods of Babylon and just neglect the God of Israel altogether and say, all right, we're Babylonians now. Maybe that's the way you should respond. And both of these things happened. You had people who, uh, who would stand up against the Babylonians who defied Babylon, and it really didn't end well for that group. Um, and then you had people who would just neglect the God of Israel and say, we are now fully Babylonians, and we will embrace that identity. And there was a prophet that during the time that they were in exile, and his name was Jeremiah. Uh, and Jeremiah, he sent a letter to the Israelites to tell them of another way that they should live in exile. Here's another way you should live. You don't have to choose one of these two that I've already mentioned. You can live this way. And this is what the letter that Jeremiah wrote uh, to the Israelites says. It says, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. He says, build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away. Work for the peace and the prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. For its welfare will determine your welfare. So what God is telling the people through the prophet Jeremiah, he's telling them, and you know, they're asking the question, how do we live here? Just live. Live. Build homes. Plan to stay. Have families. Engage in the well-being of Babylon. And not in spite of God, not, not in neglecting the God of Israel, but on behalf of him. He says, pray Pray to the Lord for it. Pray to the Lord for Babylon. And I think we need to ask ourselves really similar questions as the Israelites did. As believers, can we live in a godless culture? Can we live in a culture that is broken, a culture that is dysfunctional, a culture that is politically a mess? Can we live in it? Can we engage in it? Can we honor God in it? In the book of Daniel, we see uh, Daniel and he has these three friends and they prove that you can live this way. You can engage in the community. You can choose to honor the leadership there while never neglecting God or your faithful lifestyle. So Daniel, a guy named Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were incredibly bright men in the land of Israel. And so when uh, the Babylonians conquered Israel and brought them into Babylon, uh, they took some of the bright, best and brightest from the Israelite people and they trained them in the language and the literature of Babylon, really uh, for the purpose of brainwashing them into becoming Babylonians. Uh, they wanted the Israelite leaders to, be become, to become Babylonians. So Daniel and his friends were selected in that group because they were some of the bright, brightest uh, to come in from Israel. They were given Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. You had Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. And Azariah was called Abednego. You may have heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, the reality with these guys is that they lived their life the way that God instructed through Jeremiah. They engaged with the culture and the land. They thrived in their training and their leadership. They never neglected who they were, never giving into the sinful lifestyles of the Babylonians. And yet it was during this time that even though they were living different than the Babylonians were, that they found great favor in the leadership and in the eyes of the Babylonian king. In Daniel 1, it says that no one impressed King Nebuchadnezzar as much as these four men, and that every time that he would consult them on any kind of wisdom uh, or balanced judgment, that they proved themselves 10 times more capable than any of the magicians or the enchanters uh, of his entire kingdom. So the king loved these guys. Like he could just lean on them. They gave him wisdom. So everything was going great uh, for these guys until the king decided that he was going to build this 90-foot tall gold statue. If you're a fan of VeggieTales, it also could be a chocolate bunny. And so he built this 90-foot gold statue, and they made this decree that everyone in the land was to bow down and worship this gold statue. Well, for these four men, that, that goes against uh, their call as, as God's chosen people. And so they're like, we're not going to do that. And so they didn't. And then this is what you see in Daniel 3. It says, some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on these Jews. So informed on these guys. And they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn and all those other instruments. Um, I don't know why they always have to name every single instrument. Just say a bunch of instruments. Um, it says that decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which they knew King Nebuchadnezzar liked, he says, who you put in charge of the province of Babylon, they paid no attention to you, your majesty. They refused to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar was known as being uh, pretty narcissistic. That was hard to say. You know what I mean? Um, he was very full of himself. And so this really made him upset. It made him upset that these people would not bow down to his golden statue. And so he brings them in, in front of himself, and he challenges them. And this is how the three men replied, and I love this. They said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. And I love this, but even if he doesn't, even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue that you have set up. And I, this is probably like my favorite st statement that uh, a believer in, in the entirety of the Bible says. He's like, God is able to save us. He'll rescue us from his power. But even if he doesn't, even if God doesn't show up in the midst of, of, of our issue here, it's not going to change how we believe. It's not going to change our faith. We will still never serve your gods and worship your statue. Love that. And how the story goes is uh, King was like, fine. And he threw them into the fiery furnace. And that could have been the end of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, but God did save them. He did save them. And then King Nebuchadnezzar, he had this front row view to the power of the one true God. And this is what he says after. He says, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make this decree. So he made a new decree. He said, if any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. And that's pretty intense. He says, there is no other God who can rescue like this. So in all of this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being faithful to God, his glory was revealed to this king. It says, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. So there is favor for those who stand for the Lord, living God's desired way to how you should live in exile. Amen? So there's another story that's very similar in lesson to this later in Daniel. You have King Nebuchadnezzar, who was followed up uh, by King Belshazzar, who was then followed up by King Darius the Mede of the Mede and Persians. So the whole time that Israel was in exile, uh, the people who had conquered them and ruling over them, they were being conquered by other people and being conquered by other people. And all in all of that, the Israelites were still in exile under those leaders. So it was under Darius the Mede, this new king, that you see Daniel being at this incredible place of leadership. And the king loved Daniel more than any of his other administrators and his officers, which made all of them jealous. No one liked Daniel because how much the king liked him. And so they decided we need to get rid of Daniel. That's the, that's the best thing for us. We need to get rid of Daniel. So this is how that story goes. It says, the administrators and the high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders for the next 30 days that any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now your majesty, majesty issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. And then it says, but when Daniel, which, so the king signed the law, because obviously the king's like, well, 30 days, everybody only has to worship me. That sounds pretty good. Let's sign that thing. So he did. Uh, and then when you go on to see, it says, when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, that no one was allowed to pray or worship anyone other than the king, it says he went home and he knelt down as his as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem, and he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. So Daniel was like, cool decree. I'm still going to live my life the way God has asked me to live. So then the officials went together to Daniel's house, and they found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Hey, did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone divine or human except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? And the king's like, well, yeah, I signed that law, obviously. Uh, that decision still stands. It's an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be rebuked. So then they told the king, well, you know, that guy Daniel... 
uh, one of the captives from Judah, he's ignoring you and your law, and he still prays to God three times a day. They got him. They're like, we tricked everybody in this story, and Daniel's going to be killed. Because they knew God, Daniel would never neglect his God. And so the king had to have Daniel killed because he made this decree. And you might know how the story goes. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den before uh, the king actually threw him in. He told Daniel, I really hope that your God saves you. I really hope that your God saves you. Uh, but there he goes into the lion's den. It says the next morning that the king couldn't even sleep. But he got up the next morning. He ran to the lion's den. And he called out for Daniel, just hoping he'd respond. And Daniel said, long live the king. My God sent his angels to shut the lion's mouth so they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight. And I have not wronged you, your majesty. And the king was ecstatic. He was like, Daniel, praise be to the God of Israel. He then got mad at the people who tricked Daniel. And let's just say that when they were in the lion's den, uh, the lion's mouths were not shut. So there's that part. But Daniel, he served the king and he served the kingdom wholeheartedly. But he didn't let the culture and the sinfulness of others affect his faithfulness to God. You know, it wasn't long after this that the, that the exile in Babylon actually ended for the Israelites. And they got to go back into the promised land. They got to rebuild Jerusalem. They got to rebuild the temple. But they never were able to, ex to escape exile. They were always still stuck in it. And it wasn't geographical anymore. But even when they returned, they were still uh, conquered and oppressed by these other empires. They were always under someone else's rule. That's why when you see Jesus come into the story um, a little later... They're still in exile, exile under the rule of the Roman Empire and Caesar Augustus. They could never escape it. And this whole picture of Israel's exile, it became an image of something more universal, something that still relates to us today. Because, you know, exile is that feeling of alienation and longing for something more no matter where you live. It's that feeling of alienation, of feeling hopeless, of being separate. And we feel that. We feel that today. We might have a great home, but... It's situated in this world that is divisive, that's scarred with pain, that has broken relationships, uh, that has death and has tragedy, both done by others and done by ourselves. But you see, what we find in our Bible is that exile is the human condition. Exile is the human condition. We will all keep repeating this pattern of human corruption leading to a Babylon that we can't escape. And it doesn't matter where we live, we're all in a way stuck in our longing for a better home, a home without this thing or a home without that thing. And I feel like there are quite a few of us in here who currently feel like we're in exile. We currently feel hopeless. We currently feel stuck. But what is our hope actually in? The Hebrew scripture prophesied that the king, a king would come, that God would send a king that would rescue the world from all the Babylons that we have created that would rescue us from the continuous cycle of exile. So when you see uh, these generations pass and you see Jesus, this Israelite Jesus of Nazareth, who lived with no home, who announced this great restoration between humanity and their God, uh, who we see care for people who didn't have homes, who welcomed in the stranger, he said God's love is shown when you invite in the outcast and when you throw parties for people who don't have a place to belong. Jesus continually will embrace the exile as he currently embraces us. And Jesus claimed that Israel, as well as all of humanity, has lost its way. That we've lost our way. See, I told you it'd come. That we all live in this exile of our own making. But he also shows us a way out. That's what Jesus does. In John 14, 16... Or 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way out. Jesus is the answer. His life and relentless love proved more powerful than our failure. He opened a pathway out of exile into eternity with our Father. What Christ's early followers realized and what we need to realize as well is that nothing in this world is the answer. Nothing in this world will, will help us escape from our exile because being home is the opposite of being in exile. But where is our home? Where is our home? What Jesus taught is that we are not citizens of this world. And that when he came to set up his kingdom, like was prophesied throughout the Old Testament, it was not an earthly kingdom. 
they all expected it to be. That's why so many Jews don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, because they thought he would come and physically liberate them from the oppression of their exile, that is, the Israelite nation would be restored with their savior, by their deliverer, by their king. They expected the king, a king like Saul instead of the carpenter from Nazareth. But what did Jesus say to Pilate when he was about to be delivered over to his death? My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. And this is what we need to recognize, that we 